Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Steele. I'm the artistic director at VTAPE, where we acknowledge that we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit River, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Wendat. Toronto is in the dish with one spoon uh, territory, which is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, uh, the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Thank you, Lisa. Artistic Director at VTA, thank you so much. Um, got a couple of uh, real quick comments before we get to the conversation that we're all looking forward to. Um, we've been planning this event for over a year, but heck, COVID got in the way. so. We postponed it from last spring till now, but we don't want to postpone it anymore. So um, I'd like to thank Dustin Lawrence and Kira Bolt for behind the scenes work. They're making this happen on through the website and uh, through, through connecting with Zoom. Um, <laughs> the, uh, we're very excited about having Sarah Ty Black join with Glace Lawrence in conversation. It was Glace's idea right away. And uh, we thought it was a brilliant idea to have the two of you get together. And unlike most of the other guests that we're bringing in today, you are not old friends. So you are new acquaintances. So that I think it brings a certain energy to the conversation. Just a little bit about the Being With series that we've done. We've done three now, or this will be our third, I should say. Uh, we started with Tom Sherman a few years ago. Then we did um, Shelley. Shelley Nero last, well, been more than a year ago. Um, and now Glace Lawrence. It, it's a way for us to kind of connect with an artist who's contributed a great deal to the community, to the, to the practice of film and video. And it's also a way of VTAPE of getting, uh, uh, checking all of our, our materials at VTAPE to make sure they're accurate, to make sure that all of the titles have been digitized, to find some work that hasn't been maybe screened for a while or hasn't been digitized for a while. So it's a real way of us for, to check in in depth with an artist that we respect tremendously, and that would be Glace Lawrence. Um, we've known Glace for, I don't know. <laughs> Very long a time. Long time. <laughs> yeah. Decades. Yeah. And we've worked with Glace um, individually and together uh, through Trinity Square video projects, through A-Space projects, mm -hmm. and all sorts of other things. So it's really a treat for us to be able to focus on Glace today, this afternoon, with Sarah Tai, as well as some other guests, some guests that will be coming in. We've got Karen King, Tony Brown, and Douglas Stewart joining us at around the three o'clock mark. We're not going to be too uptight about timing, but when it feels comfortable, mm -hmm. then we'll be inviting those folks in. Cam Bailey will join us for the last 30 minutes of the conversation. He's quite busy running TIFF, as <laughs> usual, but he's, it's great that he'll be able to join us for the last part of, that, of this event. And unfortunately, um, we will not be joined by Andrea Fotona this afternoon. She's not too little into the weather, but she is watching and she is with us in spirit, I guarantee it. So without further ado, here goes the conversation between Glace Lawrence and Sarah Ty Black. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Kim and Lisa. Glace, it's happening. Sarah Ty, yes. Sorry, I have to do a little uh, you know, celebration here. I'm, I'm so, so excited to just have this opportunity to speak with you and speak with you in depth because, you know, as Kim said, we are new friends. We were very much in passing, you know, the, the black, folks in the, black folks in the art style where we're like, hello, hello. <laughs> and we keep that in the back of our head <laughs> so let's uh let's start from the very beginning let's start from the beginning and I I, I know that uh before you worked in film and video you were working in radio and I know you you graduated from the radio and television broadcasting program at uh Centennial College so tell me a bit about that yeah that was uh, <laughs> I I really uh had a, I have to say, a well-rounded education at Centennial and uh, had the opportunity to 
be the first uh, student in that program to do an internship outside of the country. I had this, um, Don Gray was the person that ran the program and I had this great instructor, Ken Cassavoy, who was also a um, uh, archeologist. I don't know if he was an am amateur archeologist, but he would go every summer when he was off uh, with his family to these digs. And so he uh, was savvy to how to navigate the permit uh, situation in the United States. So he helped me and guided me and I got, I don't know if it, what it was called at that time, but I um, applied uh, to be an intern at WBLK uh, before G98.7 came to Toronto, there was WBLK in <laughs> Buffalo that, and 93.7 that we all listened to in, in Toronto. And um, I got accepted and I was, uh, I'd spent a semester in Buffalo as a copywriter um, at WBLK. And then I was lucky enough to host a, like it was a night shift program called The Quiet Storm with okay. Doug Blakely. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes, The Quiet Storm um, with Doug Blakely, wonderful uh, person, my mentor, um, who oversee my internship was a guy named Lee Zimmerman who told me, you know, Blaze, you're a black person and you're gonna have to be better than the rest to succeed in society. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had, you know, that foundation. Um, I, my first job was at CKO radio, uh, all news radio station. And then one day this young woman came, her name was Lorraine Hubbard. She was executive director at the Ontario Black History Society. And she did an interview and I met her and I kept in touch and I got a little bit disillusioned about um, writing car commercials. I did like doing the uh, Canadian opera uh, um, company commercials though. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I did a whole series of PSAs on Canada's prime ministers and they were produced and um, so I left uh, the industry and I went to be the second executive director at the Ontario Black History Society. And I was there for four years. And um, we had a festival there um, that was a multidisciplinary arts festival with history as the base. And I think that, you know, it was where Ayanna Black and Vernon Eccles met and that was the impetus for the formation of uh, Canadian Artists Network, Black Artists in Action, Canvaya. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then of course there was the Black Women Video Network. But to cut a long story short, I um, took a workshop led by Cornelia Weingordon. Uh, Cornelia, I hope you're here. <laughs> um, uh, she's in Vancouver and she led, it was an all women's workshop and you know, we're plugging in XLR cables and, you know, like really uh, empowering women with this technology at the time. And that's my, that was my introduction because it was done at Trinity Square Video. And mm -hmm. that's how I was introduced to Trinity. And I ended up working there as a workshop and publicity coordinator. And in all around this time, I took this special film techniques course at OCAD by, led by Chris Terry and desire came mm -hmm. as a result of, mm -hmm. of that course. Yeah, let's let's talk about desire. 1989 year. I was yes. <laughs> Recently yeah. curated by Wanda Nanabush in the group show at the AGO, Toronto yeah. Tributes and Tributaries. Um, just talk us through the the idea and your thoughts behind this film, and also how maybe the beginning of your transition into film and video was really bolstered by the collective networks that you're a part of. You spoke briefly of, you know, um, Black Film and Video Network. And I know you were a uh, ad hoc committee member. I had to go to my notes <laughs> for, the, for the CAN BAIA. So yeah, maybe you could tell us just a bit about how this kind of orbit was was kind of producing or reproducing or, you know, in, inflecting your experience as an emerging filmmaker and video artist. 
Well, it's really, it's, it's, it all feels like, um, seems like a blur, but uh, really and truly, um, all of this came together at about the same time. So, um, Black Film Video, I can't remember the exact year that it was formed, uh, was formed, I was one of the founding members with Karen King, Claire Prato, they were like, uh, uh, there was an exhaustive oral history done by Amanda Paris. So there were 22 of us <laughs> as founding members. And, um, and then Can Bahia, I think really evolved out of that um, Ontario Black History Society Festival at Heart of Harborfront. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was being formed around the same time. So it was, there was like a beehive of activity, not only in the black arts community, black film video making community, but in the uh, diverse, culturally diverse community, because there was a group called Full Screen. Uh, Richard Fung was a part of that, mm -hmm. um, that came together. Uh, and really at the heart of it were the fact that we felt that there wasn't representation at the arts council levels, you know, at all of them, Canada Council, Ontario Arts Council, and for people living in Toronto, the Toronto Arts Council. So there was a lot of art activism at that time, and God knows how we had time to make the work. You know, when I really think about it, you know, a lot of us who were leading those movements really were not making the work that we should have because we were, um, uh, involved in this kind of arts activism. I know mm -hmm. Cameron was mm -hmm. um, as well. And um, uh, that led to my working at the Canadian Film Center as a coordinator of a program. They call it the Summer Lab and then eventually the Fall Lab. And the most successful um, year, I think of that program, it wasn't like a full year, like their residency program, like a nine month program, mm -hmm. but it was, um, you know, Clement Virgo, um, Damon de Oliveira, um, uh, Mina Shum, uh, Stephen Williams, uh, all, you know, and more came out of those uh, programs. I think Karen was involved in the Fall Lab, um, uh, Keith uh, was involved in the Fall Lab, I think. Uh, the Atatouis uh, were involved in one of those or both of those labs. So it was a really exciting and energetic time. You know, uh, early 90s was also the first time I went to West Africa to do research as part of the Salafi Multidisciplinary Arts Festival. So. Mm -hmm. Desire came in 89, and then The Color of Immunity came in 1991. And The Color of Immunity was a collaboration uh, project called Toronto Living with AIDS. I think Andy Fabo, John Grayson, a number of people were involved with it. And I think it was because I was at Trinity Square Video at the time that I was um, able to put together this idea, but that kind of intersection <laughs> mm -hmm. um, actually was a few years in the making because my very, like I was doing training with Lorraine Hubbard with the Black History Society, and I would go out and do presentations on Black history. And my very first presentation was to a Black gay men's group called ZAMI which is where I met Douglas. Mm -hmm. And so after that period of time, I think Douglas, I don't know if he was the executive director at uh, Black Cap, the Black Coalition for AIDS Prevention, um, but I collaborated with Douglas and Black Cap on the color of immunity, uh, HIV uh, prevention uh, and awareness geared to black heterosexual woman about um, uh, prevention and really and truly the stats showed that black women uh, in relationships with men who were on the down low were um, 
their numbers in terms of HIV and AIDS were uh, rising. So the idea was to do a video that was not conventional, that would um, speak in a language that uh, young women and men would understand and, mm -hmm. and would relate to. Mm -hmm. So uh, that collaboration happened. And then Tony and I were in a workshop that the Black Film Video Network um, did, uh, led by Haile Garima. It was a drama workshop. And I think that's where we met Tony. We could go on and, and clarify if necessary. But um, we came together and uh, bid because the Ministry of Health was reaching out to the Black community, the Asian community, the gay community, about artists in those communities creating these 30 second uh, commercials mm -hmm. um, about HIV and AIDS prevention. And so Tony and I got together and we um, wrote and pitched them, got the contract, and that's how our company was founded mm -hmm. from those AIDS PSAs. And again, it was another collaboration with uh, Black Cap as consultants in terms of content and making sure that what we were, you know, presenting was accurate in a dramatic, you know, uh, form. That's Tony um, directing the couple, uh, Black couple, uh, 30 second PSA. And that's Ricardo Diaz with the camera on the dolly. And I can't remember, hold on. I think that was shot at my place on Dalton. <laughs> it looks like my place. I just can't remember. But anyhow, I, I know that's my Shoji screen. Uh, it appears in the color of immunity. It appears everywhere um, uh, at the time. So I love, I love, sorry to interrupt, but I love this scene specifically where he's like loosening his tie and he's like, no, don't think I'm getting any idea. <laughs> It's like, yes, I thought like looking at that sort that line from the color of and I said, did I really write that? <laughs> I think I'm, I'm not getting ready to get it on or anything like that. I just uh, that was funny. The color of immunity. I you know like I remember you know in preparation for this, looking at everything again, and um, I was just saying oh my God, I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel yeah. like there are some things about 1991 that are inevitably <laughs> corny in retrospect, but even just watching it, watching it this week alone, I was like, the language here. Okay. It is like very, I, I, I so appreciate the way that you were working with language to kind of transgress maybe what were like previous language structures of like Ministry of Health PSAs, uh, you know, and I was wondering maybe if you could talk a bit about this transition period between Desire and making the PSAs with Tony and, and founding your company together. Yeah, um, so Desire happened. I didn't know Tony at the time. And um, so you're saying between Desire and the color of immunity? Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was when you, uh, sorry, so sorry to interrupt. Is this, when did you move back to, move to Vancouver? Oh, that came after, that came We'll after. touch on that later then, okay. Yeah, that happened much later in, later in the 90s. Um, so we came together in the early 90s. We did the Ministry of, of Health uh, PSAs. Um, we did a variety of commercials. We, we teamed up with uh, Joel Goldberg, who was doing some, uh, a lot of work actually. And so we, um, I was looking at our promo reel and uh, I forgot about those Bravo commercials, uh, you know, <laughs> my kingdom for a horse and the guy on the, on the horse in the field uh, singing <laughs> opera, trying to sing opera. I mean, those were, you know, those were great. I remember uh, Brumby because uh, the Brumby boot commercials. That because, commercial was real. Like that was a real one. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was really good. I, I can't remember if it was Tony that directed that one or both he and Joel directed that one. I really enjoyed looking at that again. And of course, you know, uh, the AIDS PSA. So 
But the biggest project that we undertook under Rhino was um, Coming to Voice, the documentary looking at mm -hmm. the emergence of Black cinema in Canada and um, following the making of the feature film Rude and the making of the feature film Soul Survivor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were following Karen, Clement and Damon as they, from the very beginning, I remember sitting in the office that day and I couldn't, I couldn't go. So I said, Tony, you know, they're, they're meeting up at the film center today. Can you go up there and, and uh, you know, sh shoot it? And he did. And it was, it was such an important uh, moment for them because, mm -hmm. and it was filled with, you know, this bit of drama that was going on because I think at first they weren't approved and then they were approved. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I love seeing Karen talking about, you know, look at all this man, like making me do all this work, right? <laughs> Carrying all this stuff. Yeah. And that whole thing about, you know, you can tell a, a poor filmmaker by their shoes, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, um, so that was uh, really mo uh, momentous. Uh, that documentary, we um, had to organize shoots in Vancouver because we couldn't afford to go there. So Selena Williams and Andrea Fatona, who was living in Vancouver at the time, uh, we hired was Carla Wolf, uh, who shot those uh, videos. In New Brunswick, uh, the late great Errol uh, Williams um, and the folks, uh, Tony, Tony Morzetti and, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm missing a name. Um, at the New Brunswick Filmmakers Co-op mm -hmm. shot that segment, if you uh, see the moment where Errol does the direct to camera address about being a, you know, we're not Ken Burns, but we're good filmmakers. We're that was so good. <laughs> it was, it's like, the, I love, I was speaking to you about this yesterday and how I kind of have, kind of, I extremely have this kind of COVID brain right now and it's been hard for me to focus on like media or anything but watching and coming to voice and just the the like consistent presentness of it I was like I was really attached to it and then I was really grateful to like be able to have that attachment to something I was watching which I haven't experienced in so long and I think especially with with Rude being what it is within like Black Canadian film history and then you're tying together all these kind of like sub subjectivities surrounding this time of Black Canadian filmmaking which is like I think a lot of the time, the impulse when we're talking about a specific period of history is to just turn to the work and the work is important, but I, I love what you've given us with coming to voice and the ability to hear people have these like beautiful little glib moments where they're like, actually Ken Burns, you weren't the first one. This is actually our thing or, or, you know, the ability to hear from, from women, especially, I know earlier you were talking about the fact that the folks doing these this collective work like it's kind of wild that you would have energy or capacity to even take on like actual filmmaking after all the advocacy you're doing and I think also about the role in women in that and and you know folks who were maybe mothering also at the time which is a full-time job in itself you know and I'm wondering maybe if you could speak to just the, the women of this period who were in your orbit. I know I know Claire Preto was a, a big mentor for you and a guide and a touchstone and someone who opened up a lot of opportunities for not just black women, but for everyone working at this moment. Yes, she did. And she is like Claire really was the mother of the movement, you know, when I really think about it, you know, um, her son, Ian Kamau, uh, was right there for all of it from, I'm sure he was like, you know, a baby to, to the young man that he's become today, the young creative that he's become today. Um, uh, I remember Karen King at one of our board meetings, breastfeeding, I think it was Chike, her first son, um, breastfeeding Chike um, under a um, feeding cloth uh, as the meeting was going on. I know Claire was there for uh, the birth, you know, like we were um, all very, very um, uh, active. And then, you know, the woman that actually um, had the time, made the time to have children. Um, uh, I remember speaking to Zenibu, um, Irene Davis, when she was here 
uh, for images a few years ago, that wonderful program that you put together and the panel discussion afterwards. And I was lucky to be able to spend some time with her while she was here. And she said, you know, with, you know, we had two children, and, but she wouldn't have been able to have done that had her husband, uh, Mark Cherry, who also, you know, I think shot her work, Mm -hmm. um, wasn't there when she was going out there and, you know, um, uh, making the work and or later as a professor teaching. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it's, you know, Christine Brown had, she had her eldest and then she had twins, you know, and so the fact that she's the first uh, black female director of a feature film in Canada, Mm -hmm. you know, is really an amazing feat. Um, and now she's like an accomplished author. And um, I think about those times. I think about myself uh, trying to make this decision that I was making this documentary that I'm still have to finish called Woman Behind the Camera. It really is. I think um, um, Black Women Film Canada is doing a series of workshops right now called Mothering in the Industry. And that's really what it's about. It's about whether or not uh, Black women in Canada, um, and I, because of my experiences in Ghana, I, I shot interviews with a Black women in um, Ghanaian women who worked in the industry and how difficult that decision is for them in a more traditional culture to you know, show up and perform and then also be expected to have you know, a traditional home and children and, and uh, that delicate balancing act. You know, I never did end up having children, but I have, thank God my sister did. <laughs> and you know, I have uh, two lovely nieces and I'm now a great aunt to like our next generation in our family, they're all boys. So that's been a new experience. So the art and culture things that I did with my nieces, I now do with them. This is pre before COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it was a tough decision. I, my mother who was really my inspiration and my father as well, but my mother really said, there was a line from Christine Brown's uh, film from Nevis to her first film where she did the voiceover where her, the voices of the mother is saying, don't go out there and, you know, be like those other girls and, you know, kind of like do whatever. My mother's whole thing was that, you know, um, being a product of divorce, she said that, you know, make sure that you um, earn your own money and that you're, you know, independent and self-sufficient, you know, um, because she didn't want what happened to her to happen to me. Mm -hmm. So I really took that to heart uh, very seriously because I saw how difficult it was to you know, go from a two family household with three kids to a single family household and having to go out there and, and work and provide for you know, three children. You know? mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's your question. No, it definitely does. And I just think it's such an, an important thing to talk about. And, and yesterday when we were talking about coming to Voices, you kind of mentioned that you wish there was less of a, uh, a platform for the many men that were in the film. But I think that what you've done with that film has actually made space with women. Uh, funnily enough, like it, it, it still holds up in, in terms of, um, if not its gender parity, then its intentions, you know, and you mm -hmm. can really see that. Um, in the work, it, it does. It doesn't. Um, even the men, in some ways, I feel like your your vision kind of sometimes puts them in their place. You know, there's a moment <laughs> when, when John Acomfer is being a little bit of a snob, and you're navigating that, and it's just really, it's really interesting to watch. Um, I think another big part of that, in terms of when I'm thinking about your work, is not just the relationship of Black Canadian filmmakers and documentary filmmakers of William Greaves, but your own personal working relationship. And I was wondering if he could maybe talk to us a bit about that, um, because I know, you know, what the, the sense of what I'm getting from reading these oral histories, from looking at these documents is the, the, the togetherness and the collectiveness and how when one person gets in the door, they're trying to bring everyone else with them. And I'm really seeing that with, you know, like Claire, like I mentioned, and, and William as well. 
Right, right. Um, you know, it first of all, it was just really an honor. Like if you can interview, I, I think I was just really a fortunate. Um, if you can interview any and any, anybody in, in terms of black filmmaking, black documentary filmmaking, um, you know, drama is a whole other thing, but mm -hmm. um, William Greaves uh, granting us, giving us permission to come and interview him was really uh, a high moment. We went to New York and um, we interviewed him. And I told you the story about that interview that there were two interviews. Um, <laughs> And we had a, after we shot the interview with Bill and then we're going on the streets of New York and getting, getting some um, um, scenics. Um, I just wanted to l watch back at something and then I'm listening and I'm hearing this clunk, 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 clunk. And what had happened was it was a sound person, you know, we, Justine Pilmot, Pimlot, who's now a producer at the NFB was our sound person. We'd been shooting with her but we couldn't afford to bring her to New York. It's kind of like, couldn't afford to bring her to New York. We couldn't afford to bring Tony uh, <laughs> to Cannes, you know, like it was, you know, it's everything that you think of independent documentary filmmaker when you are making something that you're not, you know, you don't have all the money or enough money to make, yeah. although it was, you know, still a big budget. Um, it was still a hustle. Mm -hmm. And so the sound person had um, um, hadn't done uh, disconnected something. So we had this. Bill Greaves allowed us back into his offices to reshoot the whole thing over again. So yeah, all of those moments, you, <laughs> you know, that moment, you know, the you know that moment at the end where he says, you know, agitate agitate like that's all the second interview mm -hmm. and um you know he was he was so gracious and um uh i'll never forget that uh the relationship working with uh st Clair born uh, karen Tyrrell and i uh coordinated the uh, black story documentary workshop with st Clair born who is no longer with us um, Bill Greaves also passed away. Um, uh, St. Clair was such a pivotal figure for us because of his um, philosophy. And in fact, making Coming to Voice, I did follow his philosophy about the Black documentary or the Black story. Because mm -hmm. what I did was, I think we just juxtaposed what was happening in mainstream cinema, and Cameron was the thread for that, it did it brilliantly, um, talking about what was going on in mainstream cinema and what was happening in the black community at the same time. And so that was the model that we used, um, uh, you know, his, his story, and then there was high, highly uh, Garima. But I think in back in the days that we did, you know, a lot of uh, Charles Fuller, um, mm -hmm. also came up and did a workshop, um, a drama workshop that I was a participant in. We, uh, when I look back at that moment, I said, you know, there were a lot of, um, we didn't have, I think, any female stalwarts um, come and teach us, but the men who did come and teach us were, you know, highly committed to the craft, highly committed to helping us, um, succeed and I think um, we learned a lot from them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, yeah that you know and then of course the the granddaddy of hip them all Usman Semben you know I had the opportunity to um, not only meet him I mean my French was just so not good I traveled to West Africa or the francophone speaking countries uh, with my, you know, three years of conversational uh, French and, um, uh, you know, my uh, dictionary <laughs> French. There is, there is, as someone who was raised <laughs> by a West African father, there is no greater shame than not speaking French to a, to a West African French speaker. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, in my broken French. So anyhow, I showed up, I was doing research for the Salafi Festival because 
Um, I had gone to Ghana first and then to, um, I did, uh, was in Burkina Faso, not during the film festival, the Fespaco festival, but I remember spending Christmas in Burkina Faso, a uh, Muslim country, that was, that was interesting. And then I went to Senegal and I had, you know, we'd been communicating with uh, Sam Ben's office and, um, and with Sam Ben and, you know, he directed us to his distributor in New York because we wanted to do a retrospective. And we, I get there and, oh, I'm shooting. I'm going to Tiez uh, tomorrow. If you want to come, come down, <laughs> be here at six o'clock in the morning. So I, you know, I checked into the hotel and everything. I went back, I packed up my bags, I checked out, you know, I went the next morning and I was there. And then I was in like, it was like a school bus, the drive from Senegal to Tiez. Mm -hmm. And we were housed in a dorm. So it was uh, one of the actresses in his film and I shared, she was the only English speaking person. So we roomed together, a lovely woman. And uh, so we were on the set and there, that's why I had uh, that picture of, mm -hmm. um, uh, myself and Sam Ben's mm -hmm. uh, secretary. Kira, uh, I think it's um, number eighteen on the slide. If you'd like to uh, bring it up, Kira is our mastermind behind the behind the scenes. Here, she's the wizard. Yes, <laughs> I'm very grateful for that. That we don't have to do it. Um, so it was myself. That picture is myself. It was um, on the left. You see is Angel, which is Sam Ben's assistant. Veronique is in the middle and she is, I think she was a, a writer, a, a critic from France. And there's yours truly with my handy uh, hardcore Pentax K1000 and um, photographs that I took from that, um, that uh, being on set uh, with some Ben ended up in a POV article that Jeff Bowie wrote about mm -hmm. Sam Ben because we had the retrospective in Toronto and we partnered with um, we partnered with the art gallery and then we uh, partnered with um, the National Gallery in Ottawa. So when Sam Ben's films, I remember we're screening them at Harbor Front um, that night. The shim the film uh, would get shipped by Greyhound, rest in peace, um, by bus to the National Gallery in Ottawa and they would start screening there. And then Sam Ben flew from uh, Toronto to Ottawa and he was feted there. And um, yeah, so in all of that activism actually came the idea from that first trip to Ghana, came the idea for a woman behind the camera because I was really lucky enough to um, be present um, in Ghana with our, NGO sponsor QSO, and there was something happening at the uh, at NAFTI, and it was a, a conference of black women from across the continent working in uh, broadcasting. And so I met all of these amazing women, uh, Pelesa Litlaka. Um, I met her. Uh, hopefully, she's with us today. And um, it was an amazing experience. And then I went back got some, did I, I think I filmed it. I went back on my own dime. I had a, a camera, an A1, a Canon A1 that I didn't know how to use. And I think uh, Ali Kazemi and I lived in the same building at the time and he had his office off of St. Clair. I said, Ali, I'm going to West Africa tomorrow. How do I, how do I work this camera? And um, <laughs> he gave me a little white card. He gave me some instructions and away I went and I shot uh, interviews and uh, had this incredible uh, road trip from uh, uh, Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso to Accra uh, with uh, Accra, uh, Ghana with a, um, uh, African, uh, he was Nigerian uh, brother who had come to the festival, had driven all the way. He lived in San Francisco, but his family was in Nigeria. He drove all the way from Nigeria to Burkina Faso for Fespaco and he didn't want to drive back alone. And so myself and uh, my friend who became my friend, uh, Dr. Mark Fields, 
we were uh, in his little Honda. There's that picture of me with the camera that is taken from that road trip. And mm -hmm. um, that's such uh, an iconic picture. It's uh, slide number 20, Kira. <laughs> <laughs> I think we showed it. I think we showed it before. I want to show it again. <laughs> <laughs> we had pulled up um, uh, for a moment because we are, you know, the earth in, um, in uh, northern uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, is that red dirt that you're seeing there. Mm -hmm. And we were coming around a bend and there was this beautiful, it was like a cabbage patch um, that was fenced in of, of greenery. So it was such a stark uh, presence. It was so beautiful that we stopped to, to look at it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think I pulled out my camera and I was shooting and that's where I think either Mark or the brother from San Francisco <laughs> took that picture. It's such, it's just such an incredible photo. I can't get over it. And wow. um, and the slide before that, number nineteen, we have you. You look pretty proficient with the A one. Now I, yeah, I did. Thanks to Ali <laughs> Kazemi. <laughs> that was at the opening ceremonies for um, Fespaco. Mm -hmm. um, so I was shooting a lot uh, with it, but really and truly, I brought it to. Um, to um, do those interviews, to do mm -hmm. start those interviews. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that, um, did I stay? Uh, Kwa Ansa uh, and his family put me up. I stayed with them uh, when I was uh, there, uh, the second time I went back uh, after he had come here. So it was Usman Semben and, and Kwa Ansa who came and Kwa Ansa, while Semben went to Ottawa, Kwa Ansa went to uh, Nova Scotia and Sylvia Hamilton, um, I think, led um, uh, sessions he had with uh, the Black community uh, mm -hmm. there. So it was it was uh, really successful. But uh, what was wonderful about the activism was to be able to create work from it. Um, I have like an 83 minute rough cut. Um, it went with me in a box to Vancouver. It came back from Vancouver in a box. And um, I finally was able to get all of the tapes digitized and, um, uh, and we'll look to uh, get funding to complete it. Mm -hmm. But it's really, you know, especially during these pandemic times that, you know, like I will have to do, um, uh, some kind of a Zoom shoot, uh, track the woman down and uh, do a Zoom shoot with them because mm -hmm. I, I don't know, you know, when I moved to Vancouver in the early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s, I kind of lost touch with a lot of people. And um, as you tend to do when you live in Vancouver. Yeah, Vancouver uh, was really isolate, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it happened, it happened to me and um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to completing that. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't wait, I can't wait for that. And um, something just in watching all of your work one after the other in, in, in <laughs> one kind of fell swoop that was really um, just so glaring was your intentions or possible intentions of uh, archiving a history in the present. Like, was it, was it going through your mind that I'm, I'm shooting this in order to document it for future generations. And I'm also thinking of, especially with your, your trip to Ghana and seeing the ways in which you're paralleling the, the roles of black women in film there and kind of mothering in or, or mentoring in these kind of um, collectives or initiatives or workshops as you were talking about. And I was wondering if that was just something that was on your mind, because when you look at this late late eighties nineties period of filmmaking, there's there's some personal vision, subjective filmmakers. There's a lot of documentary NFB, of course, and then there's yours, which I find is like a it's like a living archive, and it's very it's very clear that you're drawn to a history of us within film specifically. I I am, you know, at the time that I was making it, it's kind of like this this dialogue that came up in Coming to Voice, you know, uh, Cameron had written this really great article for Cine Action called A Cinema of Duty, looking at Jennifer Hodge de Silva's work. And I posed this question to, you know, 
you know, Christine Brown and Roger McTeer and, you know, Claire, um, I think to Selwyn Jacob as well, uh, the Canadian uh, filmmakers. And Roger was saying, well, I don't think it was a, a cinema of, of duty. I think it was a cinema of necessarily this, you know? Um, and, and at the time I was really, I don't even know if I call it ton, tunnel vision, but I was just really driven um, by my excitement about what was happening in our community and um, the fact that we were so really hidden from the mainstream, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that we had a story to tell about what we were doing and what we were creating and why we were creating the work. And so I really not just wanted to document that I wanted to tell a story about us. Uh, I didn't look at it, you know, despite my, you know, Black History Society, you know, background and, and time. I, and I okay. guess when I think about it, it was really um, something that formed my feeling of the importance of documenting that history. Um, when I was shooting it, I wasn't thinking about it, you know, broadly in that context for um, a time, but my God, looking at it now, I'm just so happy that I shot this documentary because there, you know, there are people that are no longer with us um, and their work um, that's in the documentary. And, um, you know, that particular moment uh, and, and the excitement around the first two, you know, black feature films, um, was really exciting, but the reality of what happened after that, I think was really important to talk about. Mm -hmm. And so those follow-up interviews with Damon and Karen about how uh, their distribution just like fell out the bottom and with Paul Brown, who was a producer on Soul Survivor, um, Stephen Williams's feature, uh, how that fell out uh, from the bottom, like the, the, the strategy uh, for uh, getting those films to an audience, it was really uh, important to hear mm -hmm. about the failures mm -hmm. as well as the, you know, the glitz and glam of Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a very like uh, realistic way of documenting history as opposed to a, like these were the successes Without the without the reality of it, especially for for Black artists and Black filmmakers, yeah. And um, something that we were talking about earlier was, um, as in yesterday, not earlier in this conversation, <laughs> <laughs> was was the change in the kind of climate you noticed when you moved back uh, to Toronto from Vancouver, and and kind of the change from a kind of more collectivized community-based work towards more individualized work and within that the kind of unfortunate ability for people to forget this very specifically communal activist work that took place and you know even even today it, it feels like a lot of you know peers of my own I'm like do you guys know about the black home video network <laughs> it's like, you know there is a history outside of what is happening now and things that came before and like a, a obviously a huge function of white supremacy is to cut us off from that and make us think we have to establish things anew um, when that's simply not the case there's such a this is a beautiful history of it yeah and I think you know I I am going to take ownership for that lack of uh history getting to like the next generation because um I think we all play a part in it. And I know that when I, when I made the decision to move, uh, to leave from Toronto to Vancouver, it was chasing, you know, um, uh, making a feature film. I was a producer resident. I went in with a feature uh, film script by uh, writing, directing sister team, Selena Williams and her sister uh, from Vancouver. And there was still, uh, Mike Harris had come in and there were a lot of cuts, a lot of cuts to um, uh, the arts, the Ontario Arts Council, I think was cut back to like 1970s levels and mm -hmm. the Ontario Film Development Corporation was cut. So 
Um, there was very little money here. So I went uh, chasing um, that money in Vancouver. I did get development funding. I was in the National Screen Institute's program. The first year they did the Features First program with uh, Selena and her sister. And um, did eventually get development funding from Telefilm, but the partnership didn't work out and I did end up staying there. But before I left here, I was on like five different boards, you know, <laughs> at the same time. And that's a kind of luxury you can only get when you have your own company because mm -hmm. I, uh, we had Rhino Film and Video Inc. Um, I was able to have that flexibility, but I wanted to say, okay, I've done my activism. I've done my work. I have, you know, I have been in the movement and now I'm going to go to Vancouver and focus on myself and, you know, get this feature film made and that didn't happen and I ended up staying there. Um, uh, you know, I think that the void that happened when the Black Community Network died and when Ken Baye died and, and I take responsibility too because the way that I think Ken Baye ended up, I didn't want to support it the way that it, it was and mm -hmm. it had to be something else. Uh, Black Video, Film and Video Network, I wasn't around for that um, um, ending. Um, but I think that when those two organizations went down, there was a void. So the generation coming up after us like didn't know about us. Mm -hmm. And I know that Ayanna Black, um, a poet who, who um, was the president of Can Bahia, um, made uh, strong efforts to get uh, our files into the archives of Canada. And so they are there. Mm -hmm. um, so unless you're- I found them. Okay. <laughs> you have to like actively know and seek these things out. And that's like kind of the, the contradiction of the archive. You have to already kind of know of it to know what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. But I just want to let everybody know that um, all of my files from um, the documentary coming to voice uh, are donated like the interviews, not the documentary itself, but the interviews. And I can't remember how many bankers boxes the Archives of Ontario took away, but they have been donated. Tony and I donated them to the Archives of Ontario. So if you want to do research into this particular time of uh, filmmaking, um, and the filmmakers that we interviewed, I think the interviews are there. You can, you can um, watch them. Um, uh, they're at the archives of Ontario. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So please do your research and, you know, and find our stories, exactly. <laughs> find that period, um, find those stories uh, there. But I think that we're responsible. We have to take some responsibility for the fact that this generation doesn't know about us. And then of course the wider, you know, a mainstream society is not gonna, you know, <laughs> be there um, uh, actively promoting uh, the work that we did. We have to yeah. do that. Yeah, know? yeah. That's why I've been, I've been so grateful for, you know, someone like Amanda Paris, her work in, in, in reorienting your work and, and, the, and the work of your peers and, everyone working at that time, it, it was just so, it seems just so energetic, which is something I can't even fathom right now. <laughs> In a pandemic, it's hard to, it, it really is hard to, mm -hmm. um, and, but yes, it was a very energetic period of time and mm -hmm. We were all uh, very active in the in the movement uh, to uh, get representations on arts councils, juries, to get representations on boards. Mm -hmm. um, to get, you know, people there that, you know, if you're creating a work inspired by, you know, Ayoka Chinzera or, you know, John Acumfra or Black Audio Film and, you know, that there would be people there that would have um, uh, some kind of a context mm -hmm. and understand that creativity. And that mm -hmm. was the struggle that we were having is that mm -hmm you know, we didn't have the, that kind of representation on juries. So you'd apply and you wouldn't get funded, you know? Yeah, yeah. The question of who are you legible to, it's a, it's a, it's a huge one. Yeah, 
Yeah. So uh, there is a void. I definitely know there is, but I think, uh, you know, this uh, discussion, um, writings, I think uh, research can go a long way there. Um, I think that there are a lot of things happening now in terms of um, uh, unearthing this history. And I am really excited of, about that. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, on that note, maybe we <laughs> might bring in some some special guests. Awesome. Oh, I just got a note that specifically says before bringing in special guests. Okay, we're gonna actually turn it to Kim, who's gonna explain the chat feature because Lord knows I don't have the capacity to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh, Kim's coming back, but after Kim comes in, we're gonna welcome Tony Brown, Karen King, Douglas Stewart. So I'm looking forward to that. Fantastic. Kim. <laughs> Where art thou? Unmute. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Thank you for, for answering to my yells. <laughs> I would not disobey you. Um, that was an amazing conversation, you, you guys. Thank you so much. What a, what a treasure trove of history. And now I'm totally intrigued about the, the uh, interviews at, at, in the archive. Maybe, yeah. we, maybe we should digitize those. Yes, yes. Right? Uh, Let's see what's there. Yeah. Um, but uh, I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning of this. So my name is Kim Tomzak and I'm, this is my, it's sort of my idea of the being with series, so. Sort of, come on. Welcome to everybody. <laughs> In case you don't know who I am, so the um, we would love you to make comments in the in the chat feature uh, on your you're watching on Vimeo at home, and if you go to your Vimeo screen, uh, take it off full screen. I'm going to talk slowly now because it takes a few minutes and a few seconds to do everything. So take it off full screen, and then you'll see at the bottom of the screen on the left the chat with a little bubble thing, and on the right there are the three dots. Because the three dots are always the most important thing. So go to the three dots, click on it, and it'll say pop out. You want to choose pop out. There's minimize and there's pop out. Choose pop out. And that will bring up the chat window. And feel free to make any comments and chat in there. And uh, hopefully we'll keep a record of it for both Saratai and for Glace. Great. Okay. And without further ado, those, as promised, special guests. <laughs> Thank you, Cam. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Cam. Yes, please join me in welcoming Tony Brown, Karen King, and Douglas Stewart. And uh, maybe Glace can give us a little bit of uh, introduction to these folks and how they figure in terms of your life and your work. Right. So let's see you beautiful people on mute and uh, have your videos uh, running so that we can see you. Okay. There's Tony. Hi, T. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, you got the Black Story shirt on. <laughs> I, I was listening to the story and I went to the archives because I'm just like a vintage t-shirt. I've got concert t-shirt from our way and I, I dug this up in your honor. That's awesome. That and this one is from which workshop? Is that from um, Charles Fuller or from St. Clair Bourne? It's from uh, uh, Charles, Charles, uh, yeah, Fuller. Yes. Awesome, uh, awesome. I kept it over all these years. Right. As you know, Anthony Brown is my partner in crime uh, of, of uh, if, uh, if the crime is creating uh, Black stories and beautiful work, we are both very guilty. <laughs> um, uh, Tony and I uh, formed Rhino Film and Video uh, Inc. when we met in the Haile Garima workshop. Tony, was that where we met? I... I think so. Yeah. I, so. I, I, I. I yeah, no, I, I think so. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. And yeah, honestly, you bring, brought back so many memories and it's just amazing. Like, yeah, you know, I mean, just watching your work and listening to you and what you've, you've done like over the years. And honestly, you kick my butt because I kind of dip in and out. You know, I go mainstream and place you pull me back in. <laughs> and um, we had so much like, it was just a, an important time, but we're down to what, six or seven moment? Yeah. We yeah. had our office. We we're just like so set up. And, and uh, yeah, like all the, the things we did, like the, the commercials, the Brumby commercials, the, um, uh, the work with, uh, with Doug uh, Douglas and, 
and uh, you know, and uh, the, the AIDS, uh, AIDS uh, PSAs and that too. And it was really like there were a lot of things happening, and it's 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 interesting because I you know it's it's kind of a blur in a lot of ways, you know. But but you know, but um, what you know, what you were able to bring and and working with you know like important organizations and people, you know, and, you know Douglas and and we've continued to. We're still friends, still associates, <laughs> and we, you know, with the pandemic, hopefully we'll get together in person sometime soon. But um, but it's just like such an important time. Just honestly, just listen to, you know, your 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 chats with uh, with, with Sarah and that too. Like how how much has been, how much has happened, and how much could be lost if it wasn't for the documentation of, you know, like um, uh, coming to voice and how important it is in making a statement in terms of the, the the importance of of black filmmaking and the first and and still how difficult it is but but at that time there was there was such a movement there were so so many people that came together like it was it was it was amazing like you know um meeting and like working with uh, like saint Clair born and holly dream and and just like the energy like there was so much energy and there was so there was a collective voice in, in a lot of ways at that time that may I you know maybe I'm out of the the, the fray right now, but um, it there doesn't seem to be as much energy and so much vigor because we we're just like so hungry at that time to get things done. And I remember you know just like even <laughs> we were talking about you know like coming to voice and that too, you know, going to con and that, and, and I couldn't make it. I couldn't go. I wanted to go. It's <laughs> probably a good thing I didn't go because I'd probably party and stuff like that. But you <laughs> like you just like kept kept everybody in in uh in in stride you know and kept everyone honest and you know just focus on the work and how important and yeah as we all did it was just a difficult time and, and you know just sitting at the office by myself and you know occasionally we we talk in that too and just just uh, discussing like the the, <laughs> the like the funding you know like waiting for the next piece of funding to finish the next piece you know but just going ahead because you know what it's gonna come anyway it's gonna come so waiting for that letter, waiting for that phone call, yeah. you know, just to get to the next phase, you know. And but, but, Lord knows, you know, if you're stubborn, I'm stubborn too, you know. And <laughs> it was going to happen, no matter what. So that's it. <laughs> I remember a Tony after that um, NFB meeting that we had. We won't mention who we had the meeting with, but uh, <laughs> I think I had to hold you back there, <laughs> hold you back because we went in there looking for a co-production and uh, I came out with. FAPS money, right? Uh, filmmakers uh, assistant and assistance money. I remember I just like you were just so upset, and um, we we made it anyway. We still finished it. And, is that all there is? Yeah, just yeah. like I can just knocking on doors, you know. And yeah. yeah, yeah, just uh, yeah. yeah, just pushing pushing forward, and yeah, I mean you learn learned a lot from from that time, and and that yeah. goes. I mean you're continuing to do independent work and that too, and you know, and and I was wanted to I you know I try but I just you know fall back into the the mainstream and, and do that business but you know there's still still time still still hope you know and and through that's like you know support of a B tape and not to the archives and just letting like the general public and the people now you know the young younger <laughs> I'm not aging myself <laughs> because I, I ain't old I said there's always <laughs> younger, there's always even older than me so forget it younger older whatever <laughs> you know, but um, but just like just continuing the the boys and how important it is, and not not give up. And and honestly, instead of like the sometimes I I I I see there's like everyone's going for the same piece of the pie. But you know what? I mean, we need to work together and support each other. Some people will go on and make you know do big things, but sometimes you know you got to remember the people who helped you get there. You know and and unfortunately, sometimes I see that in in the black community, and and you know um, that you they forget, you know, how they got there, and who helped them, you know, and not looking for a pat on the back, you know, because you know, I'm not about that, but but still, just remember, just just remember um, that these things just didn't happen, you know. Yeah. When you get your feature made, it didn't just happen; it was because of past experience and past past some. Um, um, you know, rewards and, and efforts and noise that was made by people like yourself and Karen and Claire and, you know, it's like Roger and, and everyone, you know, like working together and saying this, you know, 
and not accepting like no not now no but it's you know just continuing the continuing the movement and being hungry be hungry exactly exactly and uh uh speaking of hunger uh uh i'm gonna uh introduce karen king uh another mother of the movement I'm hungry <laughs> another woman in the struggle another woman behind the camera you know big time i met karen back in the day karen also came from vancouver um and um, I remember Karen King as this line producer doing like Buku commercials in Toronto. And uh, then she was a producer on, on Rude, you know, uh, trying to uh, get this film made and also having children. I remember uh, Chike was still in a, in a stroller bass bassinet you well wheeled him there so uh karen king uh welcome yeah. thank you thank you thank you that was a very interesting conversation and wow glace you've really managed to be everywhere in a way you know it's and and i think about it when i was thinking about what you were doing for me it was you were part of when you said you were on five boards i was on the board of the black film video network that was it right and you were on black film video network full screen, can buy, I don't know the other organizations, but you know, it was just, you were, you were sort of holding it all together. And it was really interesting to hear you say, I take responsibility because I know I take responsibility because I chose to start having children at the time when Claire decided it was time to walk away from the organization. And she'd really prepared me to be her you know, next in, I was the succession planning. And then for me, I was succession planning with Jen Holness and she decided she was going to go off and have children. And so there was this void that kind of became, oh, actors started leading the organization and they didn't really understand the process of filmmaking and getting access to the means of production. And they wouldn't hire Christine Brown as a executive director because she had a conflict of interest. It was like, <laughs> no, she understands what we need. So the organization lost its way. And unfortunately, the Black Film and Video Network library and archives were thrown in the dumpster. No. Oh, yes. They were thrown in the dumpster by um, who was then the, I don't know if he was the, I guess he was the ED at that point in time when he left the organization. And it's something that I, and at that point we had a, I don't know if you remember the, the centerfold that Flair did, Flair Magazine did a whole um, sort of a six, seven, eight page spread on women in film. Mm. And all of the producers were there, all of the female producers were there in their black suits, and except for me. I was either, I was neither alone as a producer. I had all the ladies of Rude with me and we were in evening gowns um, <laughs> and, or sexy attire. Because I remember Sharon was in those leather shorts that she has. And, um, yes. and we did it and we were laying across the ground, strewn across the ground. I remember so, that. Yeah, so that was a real sort of difference between the way that black women are portrayed mm. and white women are portrayed as, you know, producers in the industry. Mm. Um, but that poster, that uh, centerfold was blown up to be eight feet tall by, what is it, 14 feet wide, right? So it was a huge wall size image and the man threw it in the dumpster. Didn't make a phone call to any one of us through it along with a library, along with all of our files, everything in the dumpster well if there's any if there's any compensation for that i know that um i think orla garrigas um has files um oh really and, okay yeah, yes orla garrigas has uh files but for video, film video network files um and i think that there's a discussion going on right now about the best place for those um archives Oh, good. So there is hope. Um, there is hope. I, I wanted to bring in Douglas Stewart. Douglas and I, I don't know if anybody had, if you can pull up that still, Kira, of Douglas and I from back in the day. Um, when I think about the intersectionality of how we met, the history, 
the HIV AIDS um, activism, um, uh, the friendship that evolved from our meeting at, at ZAMI. Um, it's, and it continues to this day. We are very good friends and um, are planning that picnic together that we'll have when we're both vaccinated and can actually sit down. But Douglas and I, um, uh, to this day, like, uh, you know, you were just so instrumental and so much a part of, of my work in the early years that um, I'm just so happy, you know, I'm happy that we're all alive actually to be here to talk about this history. So Douglas, oh, there it is. Oh, wow. <laughs> there it is, that picture. Great I, God. you know, for me, when I look back at, at these photographs, I look at the earrings I was wearing, okay? And I still have those earrings. <laughs> <laughs> I still have those earrings. There are a few that I've lost along the way when I look back. I don't know, Douglas, if you have a memory of where that photograph was taken of what party. I remember the top. I remember the bag I had. I don't know if I still have it, a green leather bag. The, the strap was worn, but I love that picture. I love that picture. Thanks for sharing it um, uh, with me, Douglas. Yeah, that picture, place was taken at Mobe Restaurant. Oh! In Carlton. And it was at an uh, event that uh, I share a birth date with three other people, Trevor Gray, Anelia Stewart, who's the mother of D.B. Young oh, in hey. Africa, as well as um, uh, Jamia Zuberi. And we, January 29th, so people can record that to send us birthday wishes on January 29th next year. <laughs> and so we collectively would get together each year and have a joint birthday party. And that gathering, actually, I was looking through the albums the other day when, you know, handheld photographs, <laughs> they're all handheld as opposed to the digital versions we have. And I, in fact, I took some photographs and sent them around. But almost everyone who was in community at that time were at the gathering because between the four of us, we kind of pulled our communities in and you were there. And I, I love this photo and had to share it with you. Lovely, lovely. I absolutely love it. Now, Douglas, can you correct me? When we met at ZAMI, were you the ED of Black Cap, the Black Coalition for AIDS Prevention at that time or did that happen later? Not yet, later. And I, and I do want to say, I want to build off how Anthony started off by, you know, the importance of acknowledging the histories that have led us here and the importance of the shoulders that we stand on, right? Because I know even before all the funding and all the groups were formed, I mean, there's been this history in this country. And I'm really, I think it's so important always to acknowledge, you know, as in one of the films that I watched that you made, Glace, um, and I think it was Clement Berger who was talking about somehow we lose the fact that before the Caribbean and the people from the continent came, that, you know, Black people were here and Black people have been here. Black people have been here fighting, struggling. So we're all here right now as a part of a long trajectory of Black people being here, being on this land, right? Um, and many of them, as I'm doing work with Indigenous communities, many of them are also been mixed in with Indigenous folks. So have been holding space for so long. But in that trajectory too is all the activism that led to eventually many of us generationally coming into being and having a sense of ourselves and a sense of being able to go out there and fight also ourselves to get what we need. And the thing about meeting the three of you, Karen, Glace, and Anthony, was so much you represent that kind of tenacity that I think built off of that. And what you described, Glace, as you and Tony coming out of that uh, NFB meeting, I so could see the both of you, because that's how I know you. you both always have that, we're ready face on, game face to go get what is ours, right? And I think one of the things that I value of sharing space with many of you is how I came into a community of people who were so clear about that. We were so clear. And whether that is because some of us grew up in environments of privilege where we got seen, that allowed us to be able to go and be clear that we're not here to hide or to be invisible or to not fight for what we need. Um, you know, that's been an important feature. So just to acknowledge that, but for us to be here too and to get to do what we've been doing, so much has happened historically to make sure that that was possible. And so that leads me to saying that I'm really also happy to see that VTAPE is doing this series as it included you, Glace, because I think, especially now in COVID times when any debts I hear off hit me even harder, 
because of the lack of being able to be in community with folks. Mm. Um, I'm so seeing the value of giving people their flowers while they're here. And so Grace, I'm so happy that we're here with you to acknowledge you and for you to include us to share in that journey that so much contributors and to acknowledge and recognize so many people unfortunately pass as you said, Grace, that aren't here anymore. So it's so I'm happy to say that you're proud that you've documented some of those contributions that can be shared and passed on. And so to hear Sarah kind of say, hey, for me to see that is important because it helps also continue the journey on, right? And then we get this, what I call intergenerational sharing. And so it, it's no accident that you've got the Mark Campbell's documenting hip hop. You've got the um, Andrew Fachona documenting creative arts in this country and the history of that for by black people. And Courtney McFarland documenting what's happening in black queer communities. So that archival spirit and so many others who are now saying we've got a name and value and recognize so that it helps the people coming after us. Because I think what we were saying, Glace, as you said earlier, was that, uh, and I think I've done the same thing. We didn't do such a good job of passing it on earlier. And so it's important now to start to really use the resources and the technology now to be able to make it even more widely available. And so, so important because Glace, when you ask me that question, it's taken a long way to get there, but what I wanna acknowledge that no, I wasn't ED yet. I was actually just starting to get active in community. And what was so important that I think, you know, that needs to be acknowledged Glace is that when we called you at the Ontario Black Christian Society, I want you to know that at that time for black queer folks, we weren't always sure we were gonna be welcomed. We were not, because at that time we weren't, including around HIV AIDS work eventually. So that time when I called you, people were even, we were even hesitant, should we call? Will they even wanna come? You know, because we're a queer group and we know where we are at that point in our journey around homophobia and fighting around rights and so on. And so when you said yes, let me just say, I don't know if you've ever understood that. That was huge. That was huge. You representing a black, mainstream community organization said, of course. And you didn't just say yes. You said, of course, like, why wouldn't I? Like it was just part of you who you were to say, of course. And then you came and I remember you came and you did this presentation. So also you were so comfortable right away, engage in the space. And I don't know if you remember a young woman in the space who hadn't come to many meetings, had come to the ZAM. And so for people who don't know, ZAMI was a um, really the first, um, Formal, because there's always been, I always want to say that even though we, we say, oh, this is the first time things started. No, there's never, I mean, we're always, Black people are always organized. Black people are always creating community. Historically, even in the middle of slavery, we were, you know, understanding that, you know, nobody rolled over and let people walk all of us. We've always been resisting. And so there has always been natures of resistance, but more formally named, ZAMI was the first formal space created for Black queer people to begin to get together, to organize, to identify ourselves and holding space with each other and supporting each other. And a very, in a formal way, a named way in that, in that way. And so this young woman who came in, I remember, I don't know if you remember this space, but this young woman at some point pointedly looked at you and said, so if you knew that a historical figure in the Black community was also gay, and she hesitated because she was a little bit wondering what you, because she thought your answer was going to be no. She asked, would you also celebrate that? Would you also acknowledge, recognize, and celebrate that? And without missing a beat, Blaze, like right in the moment, you said, of course. And you, and, and I don't know if you recognize in that moment, not only, and I didn't realize how much that was an important answer to hear myself, but I remember, I think, I don't know if you remember, there was emotion in the room. And that young woman was so affected that, wow, you see us. You see us, you're saying that, while there's a lot of homophobia and so on, and people on their journey to be open and accepting, you were right there representing to us that the Black community is here. For, and it helped even me getting a more confident sense of being seen and asserting and being there shoulder to shoulder with you to keep fighting. So you gave us that gift in that moment. And the ways that you've shown up, again, around HIV AIDS, because that was another battle <laughs> to get us to a certain place, I think understandably so because of how it was thrown at Black folks, that it was us. We were the diseased people in Africa and in Haiti, Haiti, who were somehow doing this to the community. So understand we were hesitant because we also had to be careful what white supremacy was trying to do to Black people in that moment, right? So got it. Even homophobia, we get how sometimes people navigate that because of how white supremacy has done stuff to us to undermine us, to make us create hierarchy of needs, to struggle around, right? So, but you, Glace. I want you to hear and understand there's not a flower to throw at you, 
that you gave us that. <laughs> and uh, don't duck too hard because I wanted to hit you in this case. Um, but yeah, also in, and then around HIV AIDS, like I never hesitate, you were right there. And so the friendship I've had with you is that you've always been shoulder to shoulder, you show up wherever, Pride's, you're the one who calls and say, when is Pride? I want to go for a walk. You know, like you've just been very present as an, and beyond ally, overused word, you were in solidarity all the way along. So thank you, shoulder to shoulder. I want people to know who are watching this beyond all the prolific work in film, you showed up, showed out, and you represent a certain kind of intersectional, um, you know, I, I, I hate the word inclusion, but really and truly you were there, you were about showing up for people and making sure that when you're telling the story of black people, you're telling the whole story. And so your interest in the PSAs, because I remember sitting with you doing the auditions for the people, for the PSAs, and just even your kind of, I want to make sure we get it right. Who are the people that look like they fit? And you were really mad at me too, because when you shot the PSA, I wasn't able to be there. And you're like, I want you there to make sure we got it right. I think we did okay. And I thought you did okay, right? And so yourself, Karen and Tony, you've always, that's how I've experienced you. So I just want to give you, throw some flowers at all three of you that you showed up and showed up. Thank you. Thank you for the flowers. Thank you very much. That's so beautiful. I'm like slightly emotional. Courtney, I could listen to you talk all day, truly all day. And so I could be Douglas. Courtney. Douglas, be no, Courtney. sorry. It's all right. we, we you and that. Courtney were on my mind. How embarrassing. <laughs> Douglas, I could listen to you it's talk. It's all right. He's laughing somewhere going, oh my he's, God. On, he's on no. here. He's on at here. Me. At me, at me. <laughs> Um, I want to say, um, uh, truly, uh, I, I really appreciate uh, you, Douglas, um, as, a, as a person and um, a person who actually helped educate me about LGBTQ, um, uh, the LGBTQ community. And, um, and my education started earlier than that. Um, at the society, uh, uh, thanks to Lorraine Hubbard, you know, like, I think that we, we are products of our generation, our community, but we can change that. And I think my uh, uh, viewpoint um, changed and I credit the society, I credit Lorraine Hubbard for doing that. And so by the time I showed up at that ZAMI presentation, by the time you know I got that call, I was ready. You know, I was ready to be there for the community, and um, um, yeah, it was, it's uh, very very emotional uh, to think about and remember. But I also wanted to forget we haven't um, mentioned this, um, and I did want to mention this. Uh, first of all. Uh, the name that I forgot from the New Brunswick uh, Filmmaker Co-op was was Chris, and I think Chris is on 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 today. Um, he's now living in uh, Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Um, wanted to give uh, props to Chris because we share a birthday. We have our birthdays are on the same day in December, and um, uh, he was a very uh, close colleague and friend of Errol Williams. And I know that we are all still, you know, feeling his loss. Uh, he was really a champion, even behind the scenes, you didn't know. He was a champion um, for us and for the work. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was that uh, we haven't talked about the Farmer music video, the very first uh, music video I ever did. I wanted to give props to Carla Marshall for being such an amazing um, artist and performer, uh, dance all reggae. Um, uh, she was, you know, I applied to Video Fact. Um, we got the funding, but the person that connected us together and we lost her recently was Denise Jones. Mm. We were all in that building uh, at 77 Moet, um, uh, the carpet factory. So it was Rhino Film Video Inc. Word Magazine, I think, was upstairs. Uh, Jones and Jones Productions were in also in that building. So there were, you know, this the community we'd go up and down and, and visit each other. And then one day, Denise Jones walked into the office and said, "You know, there's an artist. <laughs> there's an artist that I think that you know it would be good. She has this uh, song called Farmer, and I think she 
you know, I think um, uh, you um, should maybe think about applying for video fact. And uh, we got the funding and Ricardo Diaz shot it. We shot it on Super 16. We found this, the, you know, in terms of like putting something uh, creatively into uh, something that was uh, fun, for me, that was creatively the, the best, one of the best times uh, of a fun project that I've had on a shoot. Uh, one day on this farm in Pickering, uh, we, one location, shot everything there. Carla uh, got the Lamborghini. <laughs> Carla did the costume design with the little girls and her dancers, Marvelicious and Delicious. And um, a great, yeah, great uh, uh, art department. And it's funny, the series that I'm working on now, um, Liesl Delorier, I think she might be on this call, was the art director with Rosalie Board uh, doing set deck. Liesl Delorier is like a big time set decorator now working on a big, you know, US series and, um, uh, we reconnected as a result of, of this job. Um, and um, I'm so happy, hopefully she's uh, here with us today, but really and truly uh, Joel Ziegler, you know, Ricardo I've mentioned like that whole team, like <laughs> two years ago or something, I was in Jamaica and I was at a food stall and I was looking at it and I was thinking, God damn, that stall looks exactly like the one that they created for us in Farmer, you know? So like really big props to um, Denise Jones for uh, bringing uh, uh, this project to me and for Carla Marshall for like being the boss lady that she is showing up and putting her money where her mouth is and getting all that stuff together. It was, it was a pleasure to work with her. Um, uh, um, really, really enjoyable. Um, project. Um, Karen, <laughs> I remember you had a reaction when you saw it. You said a woman directed that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think part of the, the challenge always with Black film is that we have an expectation that we put on every single piece of Black film that's exposed, especially in those days, because it was so new for us, you know, whether it was the color purple and how could they, you know, use that depiction of Black men and, you know, the, we need, and because everything had to represent everything for everyone, right? And so my expectation was that when Black women took the helm and made, made you know, music videos, they wouldn't be sexualizing Black women. And of course, not so much. <laughs> it was like, it was like a very sexy video, right? And it was like, okay. And, and, you know, so it's, it's about, for me, it, it was about us coming to understand how we could express sides of ourselves that or the need to express sides of ourselves that others of us didn't need to, you know what I mean? It was like, it was like being able to express all of who we are as black people. And that's what was starting to take bloom. That was what was starting to happen was that, that instead of having this single story that we were all coming out of, new stories were coming out, not all of them did we understand or know. And it was starting to reflect to us how much diversity there was amongst us. It's like, you know, the story of Rude has nothing to do with the life that I lived, but it gave me goosebumps when I, when I read it, right? And my, my job was to allow people to tell their stories. It wasn't for me to sort of dictate or to influence the way that stories were told but to just allow them to have to give birth. And so they may not have been the story that I would have expected them to be or whatever, but it was like, that's their experience, right? And so that's what gave it validity. So, yeah. But what was interesting about the mothering conversation that you were having earlier was I did, I was, you know, I was writing the freaking, you know, um, annual general meeting plan or whatever it was for the Black Film Video Network as I was in labor with my second child. And Chike, because at that child, I was pregnant in Khan, right? I was pregnant in Khan and went to the, the, the we opened the festival um, Canadian section and I was really pregnant then. And then, uh, but it was, it was, 
Chike was probably 18 months old when I got the call from daycare that they had a spot for him. And then we were going into shoot rude the next month. Mm. And so he was a little toddler, like, you know, and I was in production and I could not get any support from production. If somebody brought their dog to set, oh, they couldn't fall over themselves fast enough to take care of the dog. But can you just hold the baby for a minute so I can run down to set? No. Couldn't happen. Wasn't happening, not being done, you know? So I think, you know, and, and people couldn't understand, well, why are you always late? Well, I've got to take my husband to work, my child to take care. But, you know, it's like, <laughs> I'm not a single person, you know? It's like, it was very difficult, very difficult doing all of it. And um, yeah, so it's nice for it to be appreciated that, that, that mm -hmm. those were huge challenges for us huge yeah. challenges mm -hmm. yeah i can't e i can't even imagine and i'm so glad that that we got to touch on it and that yeah something no, that's not a joke it's fairly a joke. intentional within glaze's work um, i don't want to interrupt but we do have cameron bailey joining us now yes <laughs> hello everybody hello 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 fans of glaze lawrence hello everyone yes. <laughs> <Welcome to Sam laughs> <Club. laughs> <laughs> it was quite a, a quite a thing to see the film because I'd never seen the film before, Glace. Oh my God! I'd never seen really? it before. Never. I thought we gave you a DVD. Mm -mm. I saw an early cut with Cameron and our footage, but I never saw all the other context that you did. So it was really okay. terrific. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Really terrific. So glad you got to see it. And so glad you made it. Because God, if you hadn't been there, no one would believe us. Mm. <laughs> 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 welcome cameron i'm so happy you're you could make the time to i am so here. glad to be here and that uh, you know we're all here to to celebrate you um yeah i don't even want to say how long it's been that we've uh, we've it's been, known long. Each other. It's been a long time it's been a very long time and uh yeah sarah Ty, thanks for bringing this all together oh it was was not me i'm truly lucky to be here as well it's uh, the v tape folks Mm. I feel very much, especially in this this Q and A session. I'm like, I'll just take a back seat, let legends talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but Cameron, you know, we uh, even before we started um, uh, working together in these this movement, I think the first the first thing that we worked on together was the um, show at A Space. Uh, that Lori Humphreys and I um, yes. curated. Um, I still have the the one sheet for it, and I I mm. took a photo of it and sent it to Lori the other day. Um, so it was um, those early black and white films that were at the archives at the the library. So I think that was our very first collaboration together. Wow. Yeah. So you've got it. that. You've got those materials still. See, I don't have any of that. So I would okay. love, I got to see that sometime. All right. I'm just going to take a pause here. I'm still here, but I'm just going to, because I have it in my living room. Mm -hmm. Oh have, my God. We're going to get a live <laughs> picture. I have to show it to you, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> because um, uh, I, I, uh, I have it. So um, here it is. Right. Um, wow. Uh, so, uh, and I remember, you know, what was uh, kind of also special about this was that uh, we were showing Jennifer's work, Jennifer Hodge de Silva, and she was still alive uh, at that time. And I remember speaking to her, she wasn't able to attend the screening, but uh, yeah, Whoa. Lori Humphreys and I, uh, Black Perspectives on Film, and this was, I think, I think this was 1988. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we wow. go back. Yeah. That's so wild. I don't think I've seen it sick? since then. I'm sorry? <laughs> that flyer, I don't think I've seen it since 1988, but all the memories just came right back. Yeah, like, yeah, wow. I know it was, yeah, special guests, Jennifer Hodge de Silva, Roger McTeer, Claire Prato. Um, and yeah, the Tyler Texas Black Film Collection, special yes. guests, Cameron Bailey. Mm -hmm. So A Space 183 Bathurst, when it was there at, you know, every time I drive by that building, I, the memories, you know, mm. so yep. many memories. I uh, remember well. From that space. Hmm. 
Cameron, I saw that you were a camera assistant on Desire. Yeah, I don't know how I got hired for that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I was. And, uh, you yes. know, I, you know, there was a there was a time when, yeah, I was very interested in production. I'd done a little bit at university and yeah, uh, you know, Glace um, was very interested in making this and I, I wanted to work uh, on it. I hope I didn't mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, is it in focus? I don't you even did know. Not. <laughs> you did not. You did not. You know, that was a special day. Um, just remember uh, David Zapparoli, uh, David Afori Zapparoli uh, shot it. Um, ENG Hazlitt. I don't know where he is. If anybody knows where he is, I really would love to get in touch with him. It, we shot it at his home. He was a, uh, he worked professionally as an art director. So he was in charge of the, the art uh, direction and lighting. Um, Corey uh, did the uh, music uh, through my connection with Ian. That's how I met Corey. Um, my friend, uh, Rosemary Wright, my sister, you know, I, whenever I call her up on the phone, Sister Rosie, what a guan. Um, <laughs> sister Rosie played the sister. Um, Alison Mondesir did the makeup, Veronica, Veronica Siandre did continuity, and I can't remember what the dual role was that she had. Oh, she Fair. was a stylist. Okay. No, actually it was, it was, um, did Alison do the hair? Or maybe it was here. Uh, anyhow, in, in any case, um, you know, I was just so appreciative of the uh, community coming together to help me uh, make it. It's a three minute and 30 second film that talked about body image or the lack of me seeing myself in the magazines, you know, um, and uh, uh, just this lack of um, affirmation for Black women and our bodies. And um, that's why, that's what drove me to make Desire. And um, I'm just so happy that you and everybody else was there to, to help me make it, you know, and, and it was well received. It, it's, it's been to places that I haven't been to, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's curated in Spain. I've always wanted to go to Spain. I have been to Spain and um, um, yeah, it's a little film that's still, it's still um, out there mm -hmm. uh, screening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. One, and, thing and I, one thing, I, oh no, sorry, go ahead, Cameron. I was just going to ask, uh, and so can people see this through V-Tape now or where, where is it? Yeah, available? it's still, you know, uh, Coming to Voice, uh, Desire is at V-Tape. Uh, the Color of Immunity is also at V-Tape. I was uh, with the Canadian Filmmakers Distribution Center. That was the first distributor. And uh, in fact... Desire was part of a CFMDC retrospective at TIFF back in the day. I can't remember. I think the one sheet says what year it was, but yeah, it screened at TIFF um, as part of that. And then at some point I switched from uh, CFMDC to V-Tape and then just, you know, looking back at that, although, um, you know, Coming to Voice has shot film in it. Uh, Farmer was shot on Super 16 film. Um, you know, the way that the industry went, um, I, everything is being shot digitally now, right now. I shot stuff on, on video. My work after that was on video, but Coming to Voice was definitely a melange of a number of different formats. Have um, you sold it to television? I'm sorry? Have you ever sold it to television? Uh, Vision TV was my broadcaster. Um, it was first uh, broadcast, it was the licensor. So uh, first window was Vision and then it was purchased by Bravo and then it's aired on Bravo. So those so the, those licenses have expired? Yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. Well, you should try selling it to CBC Gem. Wow. Wow. Or even Canadian Reflections. I think that'd be great for Canadian Reflections. Oh wow. my God. Wow. Because wow. it's just I like, knew. it's like, it's our that. history. <laughs> I had no, I didn't know you anything. You guys are still well, hustling. You guys are hustling <laughs> right now. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah. Can't no, but stop. I think, Won't stop. But you know, but I think the thing is that I did not know the William Greaves story. Like I knew he'd come oh, and he'd no. been here, but 80 films he had credits on. Are you freaking kidding me? Yeah. 
So it's like, how does that happen? How does this man come from America, come and get 80 credits here, and then they don't hire another Black person again for another, what, 30 years? When did, wow. he, when did he finish it? When did he finish there? Between Claire got her job at the NFB in 1996. So, so how many years after that he would left? Have been quite a few. Couple yeah. Of decades. Yeah. So that's another. So that's another project. That's another project. <laughs> documentary project. That's an extension. That's a continuation or a part. Current modern time. What's happening now? What exactly, Karen? Your outreach. What happened since then? Right. Let's document and tell that story. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Karen thinking, so she's got she's got some ideas. Oh no! I listen, listen. After the George Floyd thing happened, my phone started to ring. Right, and I was on that call, Cameron, worth eight hundred. How many people? Fifteen people. Yeah, it was incredible. Okay, can you talk about that? I mean, can can Cameron? Can you uh, just mention? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, this was something that uh, we put together last summer uh, yeah, in the wake of the George Floyd murder. And and more importantly, I think how people were connecting it to what was going on in terms of uh, representation, in terms of the access that Black people had to, to get our perspectives on screen. And, you know, I thought, look, there's all of these Canadian screen institutions who have some responsibility here, including TIFF. And, you know, what can we how can we actually just you know join this conversation figure out what our role is uh figure out uh kind of challenge each other a little bit like what are we not doing um how have things not progressed you know because i mean a lot of what we're talking about today happened in the 80s and early 90s and the same questions were being asked then and so how has it been 30 years that there hasn't been that kind of progress. So it was it was TIFF, uh, it was the National Film Board, uh, the CBC, uh, the Canadian Media Fund, Telefilm Canada, uh, and the Academy, uh, the leaders of all of those organizations. And this, the, the hard part- And CTV, or Bell Media. Uh, Bell Media as well, thank you. Uh, the hard part was getting the leaders of all of those organizations to actually agree to be a part of it. Um, it. You know, everybody had, you know, these are large institutions. They have uh, they have strategy documents. They have communications people. They have all of that. Uh, but we didn't want that. We wanted the people who, who were ultimately accountable. Um, so we did it. And it was a great conversation. A lot, like hundreds of people, as you said, uh, logged on for it. Um, the next step is follow up. Um, so, you know, I've been talking to one or two others who, who were there a year ago saying, okay, now we have to actually gather again and say, what have we done in the last year, you know, um, and, and has progress actually been made? Well, I will say that I am now in the middle of training the uh, drama department at the CBC hmm. on the eradication of systemic racism within the process of creating content from conception to delivery. Hmm. That's amazing. It's that amazing. Is, that is it's been, I've been wanting to do this for, for 15 years. And, the, and yeah. absolutely since I left Global, it was like the first thing I wanted to do. I couldn't get them to pick up the phone to take my call. Hmm. And finally, they've picked up the phone. And I'm actually in there. And now we're taking a little bit of a pause because I'm in the middle of the upfronts. But it's now it's the it's really everybody's willing they've they've sort of cleaned house there's a whole new group of people who've been brought in Liam Marin from the NFB is now the director of drama there there's a Jennifer Chin who is now I, think, I believe the director of, of comedy um, so I think there is you know more diversity than the department has ever had well I'm not sure if that's true because <laughs> they did they did so all of the diversity executives left about right. six months ago, there was a mass exodus. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so they've done some rehiring now, and they have more black people in there. I don't know if they have the indigenous um, people that they had before. But now it's like, okay, so now we know that this is a barrier. <laughs> we need to remove this. And we're going to replace it with something else. Now is when it starts to get like how really committed and willing are we? Right. Because this is, you know, everybody understanding, holy crap, we've created a system that's based on white supremacy. And we're, we've actually, you know, managed to have this complete anti-Black racism, you know, running the show. And it stinks. And 
now what do we do? And okay, so here's a pathway and are we willing to follow? So that remains to be seen. I'm excited about, um, you know, and I'm hopeful that they're, they're willing to do the hard work that it's gonna take, but it's really about um, talking to people and trusting people that they've never talked to or trusted before, you know? And um, it's, it's, a, it's gonna be interesting to see what actually uh, pans out in the end. Yeah. Could, I, could, I, could I could I offer my my reflection because I you know myself as well Karen because I do some of the same work that you're doing training and all of that and phone keeps ringing emails can't even keep up as one of my uh, favorite Jamaican um, artists keeps saying Miss I'm busy that may I hide from people <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that busy <laughs> okay you know we're we're, we're we're trying to keep up but I would say in light of this conversation. I'm always, I'm, I have a side eye. I'm leery eyed of the mainstream institutions. And I know, you know, for example, Cameron, you're in, in there and, you know, doing what you can with TIFF, but and we know that when you're there, I don't know, Maxine, you know, that, that often a few people are trying to move stuff and people, we sometimes outside don't even understand and appreciate what the experience is like inside. And having been inside some institutions, I know, you know, people outside, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? But you are, but... You can't even always talk about it and what you're doing. You're meeting all kinds of challenges, so it's work. It's a certain kind of work. We all know that we've had to work in institutions. So I'm always interested about what are we doing outside of them, as we did before. So I'm interested in and what it means to also do intergenerational connections, but also even giving flowers. It's about beyond giving flowers. How are we tapping into and acknowledging the contributions of the histories of us, right? So I think of we're doing this stuff for Glace now, and so where are the ways in which beyond Origin for Glace now, how, how, how are the glaces of the world? How are they doing professionally and other people? And where are the options in this moving forward and fighting and looking, I guess I'm always interested because I have to tell you, I am leery of the mainstream because I always think of times in history when we've been in these places before mm. and there's been this excitement and da da da, and we invest. And then as you say, 30 years later, and 30 years later. Well, I, so think I always think that's the parallel of what are we doing? You know, and I'm not saying that we don't do that. I think it's great. I think we do it. Absolutely. And we have to. And I think there's hope. There's more hopefulness now. I see it. But I always think there's always important to be doing this stuff parallelly outside. Because, you know, I think ultimately that's always going to be our most confident, reliable, saving grace. Sorry, Karen, go ahead. Well, I think the difference between before and now is that before we were trying to work with the systems that were there. And now there's an acknowledgement that those systems just don't work. And there's a real need to try something completely different. And so the question is, how willing are they going to be to actually do that? Yeah. You know, but because I think I think that the, the key is that and I'm really concerned about what's going on with a lot of diversity trainers right now is are they just maintaining the status quo and still training the same thing? Or are they recognizing that people are open now to transforming the systems instead of just teaching people of color how to work within them, which is a yeah. different story. Right. Yeah, and I think it's a whole idea of, you know, it's not just the diversity training but it's putting an anti-Black racism lens on that training. And a white supremacist because, lens on that training. Yes, because- And systemic change need. <laughs> exactly. <in that> training. <laughs> <laughs> but Cameron, I'm curious about your, I mean, like, I mean, you're, you're the co-head of TIFF. I'm curious about your view because you were there in the trenches with us Back in the day, you know, there was Can Bahia, there was, um, you know, um, uh, trying to open doors at the Canadian Film Center. I know that you were instrumental in the Summer Lab program that happened up there. And, mm -hmm. and thankfully, I, I was very grateful to, to work on those programs there. Um, what is your view of, you know, the Black Film Video Network, the Can Bahia activism, then and now? Because those organizations no longer exist. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it's a tough one. And it's something I think about a lot now, more probably than I ever have. Um, you know, as I get older um, and, and, you know, the idea of continuity becomes more important. And when we talk about institutions, a lot of people, a lot of people of color have been through institutions, large, the largest ones and medium-sized and small ones, 
Um, and a lot of people left institutions for all kinds of reasons. I think we all have that experience yeah. of what made you quit, <laughs> you know, um, and why you couldn't do it anymore. Um, so I think of why isn't the Black Film and Video Network around anymore and Can Buy ya, and, you know, all of those other institutions that were built up from the grassroots couldn't sustain themselves. Um, and, you know, that I think is a, is a, is a serious problem because, you know, without the existing institutions, whether they're, you know, whether it's VTAPE or the CMDC or, you know, CFMDC or, or many others, people wouldn't know about your work as much as they do, Blaze, for instance, you know? So that continuity, the fact that VTAPE has been around for over three decades, that actually is what is allowing work of artists like you to be, to be more widely known. And had we had, the Black Film and Video Network around for that long as well. Imagine how many other uh, people it could have helped. Sure. Um, so there is something that I think can't be ignored about institutional power that comes from even just from just sticking around from continuity, um, but figuring out how to allow Black people, people of color, Indigenous people to survive in institutions for longer and to actually pass on their knowledge within the institution. And for people who choose to, not everybody's going to, and not everybody should, but for people who choose to enter the institution, that there is a foundation they're building on. They're not actually sort of fighting the same battles that their predecessors fought 10, 20, 30 years ago. That is the, the, the trick for me. I don't have the answer to it. I think, you know, we're trying some things to, to make that work, but it is hard. Um, you know, we, we try at TIFF, we try to, to find people who we think are working independently um, and, and could benefit from what an institution can offer. An institution gives you more reach often, gives you certain kind of legitimacy, power, that, those kind of things still do, um, they still do matter in some way. Um, but if you're going to invite somebody into an institution, you, you have to find ways to, to um, protect them in some way as best you can, and also just to deal with situations as they come up because they're gonna come up, you know? Uh, the institution doesn't change just because, um, you know, there's a black person, there's one black person or a few black people in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so look, I, I don't have the, the answers to it, but this, I have to say, this is kind of what is the, the ongoing um, work now for me. Okay. okay. Can, I, can I just say that I like that this conversation has taken this turn? <laughs> that we're trying to start to wrestle with, continue to make systemic change and place how our conversations usually evolve. Um, so yeah, I think this is really interesting because of who we are in this on this call and who are doing this work over time, over history. Right, right. right. Yeah, you know, I as I, as I was saying earlier, um, Cameron, I don't know if you were uh, there for that, but I was talking about you know taking responsibility about the next generation. Uh, not knowing about us, right, and and the work that we did, and uh, not being able to to uh, have some way to pass it on. Um, I have been a mentor, um, and I'm still connected to Black Women Film Canada, who is doing you know a lot of really great work, uh, bringing uh, emerging women, uh, Black women, uh, women identified, Black identified women into um, the system so to speak and the partnership with TIFF which is which is great um, uh, but I think that there need to be other groups like that doing that kind of work they need to be there you know um, and then how do they sustain themselves and how you know how do they um, which was the challenge of those organizations back in the day how do you stay alive when you're not considered a priority anymore for with the funding bodies. You know, mm -hmm. we uh, remember with Can Bahia, the first festival was amazing, the Salafi festival. But when we tried to do it again, a few years later, the funding, the money was not there for us, you know, right. and so the skepticism, Douglas, I think is real. <laughs> I think, um, you that know- That will happen again. I, I mean, I hope we're all aware of that, right? Yeah. At this moment, it's already fading and it'll well, be gone. It is, yeah, that's the scary part is it's already fading. And it means that we have to keep up the pressure on the outside. Because again, it's sort of like that agitate, agitate, agitate. It's like those people on the streets are so important to us because that's the pressure that is needed so that the inside continue to change. 
can continue to change. Right, right. And I think we have to keep, and I know, Cameron, you're kind of, you know, you're one in an institution, <laughs> mm -hmm. one. the question always becomes about what could TIFF be doing? And, and maybe there's some things that you're referencing there that TIFF could be doing to supporting those. And TIFF, and maybe it's not TIFF alone, but TIFF in um, concert with a number of other institutions that are, you know, established and have resources to support the engineering of some of those revivals or even whatever else needs to be created because we don't have to always go back because generations are now here, you know, the um, Sarahs of the world are here with ideas now about what yeah. this could look like. So what's that conversation that could be facilitated and supported to look at those kinds of entities that could be, you know, revived or recreated or reimagined for what's needed now to make those, to help those changes Karen, actually to support what Karen's saying around the outside sometimes being resources, being supports to that shifts. Because I actually believe institutions should be speaking to all of us, right? They're, they're getting all kinds of resources and we want to support them because we enjoy what they also present and provide. So it's not to say it should be only one or the other, but I think it is that, how can that work in, so I'm wondering about that, Cameron, just if you have any thoughts about that or we can speak to any of that. Um, yeah, I have, thoughts. Uh, you know, as I will always say, I do not have complete answers, but I, I do have some thoughts. Um, what we're doing right now, um, and I think uh, this is uh, what you're referring to, Glaze, we, we are working with Black Women Film, we're working with Oya Media, uh, other organizations in other communities that are like that, that are community-based media organizations. Sometimes it's as simple as just offering up space for free to meet, to put on events, um, to uh, work with us to, for instance, you know, get um, artists that they might not otherwise have as easy access to, access to those artists to, to have them uh, lead, whether it's a session on screenwriting or on, you know, direction or producing and that kind of thing. Uh, so that we're kind of the conduit, we're the bridge that can um, open up those doors. Um, so we do that, that's ongoing. Um, I think a big part of those relationships uh, ha for us, for the, the larger organization has to be uh, to listen. Uh, to to try to hear what they most need. Uh, one mistake any large organization can always fall victim to is saying, hey, look, we got this great thing and uh, we think you should use it because, you know, you look like you need it. <laughs> and, um, and instead of asking, you know, what do you need? Uh, what do you what do you want to use? How like what? what are you looking to do and how can we help? So we're trying to kind of come to it from that perspective, um, bearing in mind that there is always that kind of inequity that just has to do with like just, you know, human beings and, and just like numbers. So for instance, you know, we may have a team of like, you know, five people who would be doing something that is a part of one person's job in a smaller organization. And, and sometimes we can end up bombarding a smaller organization with, you know, emails or, you know, um, process, <laughs> things like that, that makes it hard to even work with, uh, with them or for them to work with us. So all of those kind of things we try to be very aware of, um, don't always get it right, but that, that's part of what we're doing. And then things like um, just, uh, you know, programming work that is going to um, help help be part of the change, you know, that will actually kind of get people thinking and talking and inspire them to do um, work that is, that's going to make change as well. So that's what we do. And I know time is of the essence, but I do want to say as well, in the spirit of historically of what we always been in community, along with being out here pushing and pressing, we're also here to support and to help. And you all know that historically in the community, one is this, I'll say how you, you brought me to lots of film environments where I'm going, what am, I'm not a film, why am I here? And it was <laughs> about, so I think the way we created community historically was when there was such fewer of us doing all of this, a lot of us who weren't in whatever discipline were there supporting each other. And I think Cameron, just to know, we are out here as a community also, and they're at the ready if you also need, because I think that's important when people are inside, it's about mm -hmm. how us outside can also be there to support. Absolutely. Thank Agreed. You. Agreed. Um, I, uh, I do want to say, Cameron, that uh, having, you know, uh, moved away to Vancouver and uh, come back into the city and everybody, 
I think Sarah Ty, we were alluding to this earlier. Everybody was when I came back uh, over in this corner and that corner, doing their own thing. And I I have to say thank you for uh, remembering our friendship because when I came back here, you were so welcoming and. Um, I really, really appreciated that. And we were talking about earlier about people, you know, not forgetting where they came from. And I, you are one of those people. And I just really want to give props to you for continuing to be a friend and to be supportive and, um, um, and to remembering the history. You know, it's, it's, really, it's really important that we all remember where we came from and that we didn't arrive to where we are um, alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, of course, always, Glaze. And, and thank you for preserving some of that history through your work and just through the, the relationships that you've maintained over all of these years as well, um, you know, all across this country. It's, it's meant a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank Truly, you. I mean, even beyond the scope of who's in the Zoom, it's, it's the interconnectedness, like the limit lit, limitless interconnectedness feels just so like radical and you know when when I saw your faces join the zoom I was like oh yeah oh yeah yeah and even like Cameron mentioned you mentioned earlier like your sin action article which is like if you're a black critic or a black programmer working in the present it's like that's that's the one article you go to to, to oh, find wow. out it's the one that's at least archived and documented mm -hmm. with like institutional archives so it's it's been it's been such a pleasure just to to sit alongside you folks and to listen to you and I just want to thank you all for making the time and 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 sharing your 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 histories with us because as we've established, it's so important. So thank you. Definitely, thank you. Thank I do you. want to say for for the folks watching, uh, we are going to screen Farmer. Uh, great music. <laughs> Watched it several times before this conversation to get myself hyped up, and it worked. Uh, followed by Desire. So uh, please stay tuned for that. And uh, thank you again. Thank, thank you all. You. Good to hang out with y'all. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, everybody. Uh, Tony, uh, Karen, uh, I want to thank especially uh, Kim Tonzak, Lisa Steele, um, Andrea Fatona, uh, who uh, unfortunately couldn't uh, participate today. Um, and I want, yeah, I want to do a screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. Uh, I'm trying to make sure that none of like my view is, um, is uh, full screen. And I want to do the screenshot for uh, uh, posterity. Uh, T, good to see you back. You are muted. So unmute yourself and say. I'm unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to really thank everybody who registered. I think the last time I checked, there were like 101 people who registered. I don't know how um, many people are with us uh, today, but I really appreciate the support. Um, I uh, truly enjoyed this dialogue. I, I really want to big up uh, VTape for uh, organizing this and and Andrea says, thank you for all this history. I didn't get a chance to read the rest, but I'm gonna do, are you smiling now, everybody? Screenshotting this. <laughs> and um, I wanna thank um, everybody who joined us here today. Um, Chris in Nova Scotia, if you're there, uh, thank you. Uh, Marva, Laura Jackson, who's joining us, I think from Wales, thank you. So. Uh, uh, much a part of uh, our history uh, from back in the day and um, everybody who came uh, to, um, I guess, bear witness to um, uh, the work and uh, the history. Uh, Sarah Tai, uh, big up to you. Zenabu, if you're watching, big kisses and hugs to you. Yes. Uh, dates. Um, Zenabu Ari Davis who was here a few years ago. That's when I first saw Sarah Ty in action and really appreciated the thoughtfulness of your programming for images and uh, the panel discussion with Zenabu and the other filmmakers who were there. Black experimental work, you know, like very exciting. Um, thank you so much, Sarah Ty, for this conversation. I, thank you. It's so nice to see the torch, like the next generation coming up 
and please continue your work. I saw that you did an interview uh, for the Globe the other day with Barry Jenkins. I haven't had a chance to, to read it yet, um, but yeah, keep going on doing what you're doing because it is important. Thank you. Thank you. I'm like, I'm truly humbled, even just by the idea of your energy in the present, you guys. I'm like hobbling along with this so-called torch and you guys are still shooting like at a hundred. So it really is just a privilege to uh, share this space with you all. Yes. And Tony, um, Me. my God, you know, like I haven't seen you in a year. Like when we, when we text or call each other T, G, you know, um, uh, I haven't seen him. I haven't seen him. The pandemic has, has caused that, but Thank you for being my partner in the struggle uh, from back in the day for the friendship, you know, your family, your, the little ones that are now big ones, you know, uh, um, I just appreciate your friendship. I didn't know Tony when we came together to uh, forget Rhino film video, but you know, he's this black guy from Windsor, like there's a black guy from Windsor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we worked really well together. We were very uh, compatible and a uh, very good temperament. And we really, uh, we we're in this for the love of the work. And um, I really uh, give props to you for being my partner in the struggle of making uh, film and video, black film and video in this country. And, um, yeah, I, I owe a lot to you, Tony. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, G. Thank you for the inspiration and uh, and all the the work that we've uh, we've accomplished and uh, more to more to come. And friendships we've acquired and and everyone on the panel. It's been fantastic, and we've got a lot of work to do still. You know, moving forward, and uh, yeah, keep up the fight. Absolutely. Agitate. 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 Take care. Be well. All right. All right. Enjoy Farmer, everybody. It was so much fun. Um, and uh, yes, it's sexy, but it's not, you know, when we were editing it, I just said, no, you can't can't have too many shots of Marvelicious and Delicious. It <laughs> just, it has to just be so, you know, it had to be, could not be exploitative. It had to be sexy, but it, yeah. and fun, but it's not, it wasn't exploitative. But it, I mean, compared to videos, music videos of today, I just like okay. for me. It, I'm looking you know, at it now, going, "What was I so? What was I talking about? What part of it was I? Was I well worried about?" I can't even it's tell. very egalitarianly sexy. Like I don't see the problem. <laughs> even at the time, check with us, gay men, to see what we thought, and we're like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got it. I know if you remember that, Glace, you made us watch it go, what do you, what do you think? You're probably like, mm -hmm. more, more, more. More sexiness, more sexiness. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Final goodbye. Classic Thank Black people goodbye. We're not actually saying goodbye. <laughs>